waiting for you. Oh, we're supposed to sit Mostly. <laughs> Stormy is trying to format her paper, too. But. Yeah. It's having issues. She's got tough issues. I hate formatting issues. Okay, so did anybody get a chance to look at this at all? A little bit. Yeah. That's all right. I know. I didn't get up until Saturday. I apologize for that. Um, anyway, conflict transformation, I, th I think I mentioned this a little bit. But it's it's been around actually for a while. It's been around a little long, just a little bit longer than PDG. So it's interesting. I haven't seen a lot of crossover, but I do think that there. You know, when I the re, the way that I became familiar, she's leaving already. The way that I became familiar with conflict transformation was a couple of years ago. How long has it been? Remember, was it like three years ago now? The what when you went to? When I went really? to the symposium? No, no, no. No, not really. I'm going to talk a little bit about Lily's thing. But, um, anyway, the, uh, there was a symposium here on campus about conflict transformation, and I was invited by the Ethics Center, because I knew Brian Birch a little bit from other, from other interactions across campus, and he's one in charge of the Ethics Center. And so I went, and they had George Lopez, <laughs> like Different George Lopez. Lopez. Oh. <laughs> Not the George Lopez. <laughs> but I did have to say that. Because he said he's been mistaken a few times, like when he's been flying. Like, he said that he told us a story that one time he was flying somewhere, I can't remember where. And they, he asked, uh, he's like a diamond or platinum, you know, Sky Miles member. So they'll hold the plane actually for a couple of hours, up to a few hours. A lot of time, you know, for people like that. What? Anyway, he said, you know, he was running late and he called ahead and said, George Lopez, can you please hold the plane for a, for a few minutes? And which they did. And when they got there, like, you're not George Lopez. You know? <laughs> they so they're all he mad that they, they held the, the plane. Lopez, right? the, the famous George Lopez. That's but. funny. <laughs> anyway. Hey, take advantage of it. I know, huh? But he talked. I, it was a fascinating symposium for a couple days. I actually had the opportunity to, to go around with just he and Brian for a few days, you know, to Park City and go hiking with me and his wife. It was really fun. But um, such an interesting idea. And of course, I had, you know, I'd been reading about and studying PTG for a while before this, and I just saw a lot of crossover. There's a lot of connection, um, even though, you know, post-traumatic growth, we typically think of it as an individualized thing, which overall I think it is. But when you look at you know conflict transformation, it, it applies a lot of the same ideas, only on a macro level, as I mentioned, right? So we're gonna go through some things, uh, a few things. I'm not gonna go into through this article really in depth. It wasn't, it's not research-based, it's just a conceptual article. Um, sort of a synthesis, but we'll go through a few things, okay? And then I want to show you yet another TED Talk. I know you guys are probably sick of TED Talks by yeah. now, but we're gonna watch a TED Talk, and then we're gonna watch Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Again, I know that, I, that you guys had the opportunity to watch that in, in uh, social policy. But I wanted, but we're gonna, I'm gonna have you think about and apply some other ideas See how it crosses over. Mm. Anyway, I think you'll like it. I hope you like it because I'm excited. But. All right. So theories of conflict transformation. Um, start there. So we'll make it a little bigger. I'll take it. Stormy. All right. At the very least, the foundations of a theory of conflict transformation have now been laid. Nevertheless, it is also true that a wide variety, large, wow, that a wide variety of theoretical approaches are in use among different schools of thought and practice in the field. These theories reflect both differing paradigms and different types of interventions, state and non-state, internal and external. Different authors and practitioners use basic concepts and terms in inconsistent ways. In particular, it is not clear whether the term conflict transformation is intended to describe the field broadly and thus be synonymous with conflict management and conflict resolution, 
or whether conflict transformation instead is characterized by distinct elements that can be differentiated from one to another, from the other two approaches. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> That's, I think that, that's what always gets me with this, is the terminology, because I've always thought of it as conflict resolution. Right, I know. So this whole conflict transformation is confusing. Well, it's causing me trauma. <laughs> it's causing, <laughs> it's causing me trauma. <laughs> well, I think you'll see, they, they, he goes through and defines each one. So I think this will help differentiate. Because you're right, I mean, I, I do want you to kind of understand conflict, um, conflict resolution, um, Conflict management, or conflict management, that's the first one. Conflict resolution and conflict transformation. Okay. And then we're going to talk about those in more depth. Oh, my goodness. We talked about this one little bit, didn't we? A little bit, yeah. We talked about it on, while we were driving. Huh? <laughs> Do you want me to go to the next Marisa, paragraph? Yeah. Okay. I will argue here for the latter. A distinctive theory of conflict transformation is indeed emerging. Nevertheless, I know that I know also that this new theory draws on many of the familiar concepts of conflict management and conflict resolution, and that it also rests on the same tradition of theorizing about conflict. It is best viewed not as a wholly new approach, but rather as a reconceptualization of the field in order to make it more relevant to contemporary conflicts. Another another international article that they're spelling conceptualization with an S. Yeah. Instead of the where was this done? Berghoff Handbook. Doesn't say Berghoff Research Center for Constructive Conflict Management. It looks German. I still have some work to do on the library. So it's getting a little bit dated, but it did a good job of explaining different things. Um, read the next paragraph, too. Yours was short. <laughs> Certain crucial changes in the nature of conflict call for such reconceptualization. First of all, most contemporary violent conflicts are asymmetric, marked by inequalities of power and status. Okay, what do they mean by that? Um, kind of black versus white, poor versus rich. Not necessarily. Because oh, it says asymmetric inequalities. Inequalities of power. So, and, and I mean, oftentimes power. it does play out that way, black, yeah. white, rich, poor. But he's talking actually about literal power. Okay. So, you know, you think about the Syrian conflict, you know, the rebels versus the, the government fighters that are much more better equipped, mm -hmm. um, have better weapons, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the Palestinian conflict, you know, where the Israelis are much better equipped, much better armed, that kind of thing, okay? So often, you know, lately, most conflicts have been asymmetrical. You look at you know us in Iraq, us in Afghanistan, right? Okay. Um, you look at Russia and Ukraine, Russia and Chechnya, right? Russia and the Crimea, Russia and Crimea. You know, very asymmetrical, but a lot of conflict there. Okay. Okay. Second, many contemporary conflicts are protracted, crossing repeatedly into and out of violence, and thus defying cyclical or bell-shaped models of conflict phases. Thirdly, protracted conflicts warp the society's econ economies and regions in which they are situated, creating complex emergencies fueled on the one hand by local struggles and on the other by global factors such as the arms trade and support for regimes or rebels by outside states. The complexity of these situations contrasts starkly with the relative simplicity of the core theories we can find in conflict resolution, especially those advocating win-win outcomes in two-party contests. Okay. Any questions about that? Mm -hmm. Does it make sense, or is it still is it kind of like... I think, I think as we go along, you'll make more sense of it, okay. I think. But basically, that you know, of course, it, it is a little difficult to pull apart because he is presuming that, we, that you already have a fairly good concept of conflict resolution theory. We don't have time to go in, you know, we could spend an entire course, certainly um, a semester long course just on conflict resolution theory conflict theory, conflict management theory, all those different things. Tomorrow.
how our intergenerational causes psychology? And we're not going to go through all that. So some of this should cross over to some degree, although the the um, the mediation probably focuses more on individual conflict, right? Yes, between two smart parties. Right, um, and this is the, obviously more like macro focus, yeah. but. But basically, conflict theory, you know, conflict theory, you know, is it identifies it, it. It seeks to identify um, different issues, how to um, obtain. Uh, it, it, it is very similar to mediation in this sense, you know, where you're looking at common common ground. You're trying to identify what the different. Uh, factions have in common, um, what are the sources, the primary sources of conflict, and trying to manage that conflict, right? You're trying, to, so when you say manage conflict, what does that bring to mind? What, what thoughts come to mind when you talk about managing conflict? That it's not going to go away. Okay, it's not going to go away. Why? Well, if you're managing it, it doesn't. It's not. You're not resolving it. You're just helping people maybe understand right. different points of right. view. Melissa, oh, I was just saying like containing. That's what I think of. Containing it. Like containing the problem. Okay. Like well, Korea, I think it, like we did in South in South Korea, North Korea, right? We we have not resolved that conflict by any stretch. Yeah. And in fact, even you know, even on a technical basis, we haven't resolved it because technically we're still at war with them. It's just this. We're still just operating under a ceasefire yeah. treaty, you know, that that never really formally like we don't have a full-on treaty with them. We're just like ceasefire, and that's but that's the way it's been since 1953. So, yeah, well, I, I think a lot of conflict also arises from. I mean, the conflict itself is secondary to the primary issue. So, okay. I mean, I think uh, you know, kind of focusing on the primary issue, and then you can kind of. You know, okay. kind of so let's spend, spend a minute talking about that because because that I think is really at the core of conflict transformation, right? So with mediation on an individual level, you know when you when you talk about the conflict is just secondary. What is you know when you're looking at individuals, what is it that's typically primary? Well, she could probably add to this too, but I mean she's also my class. Are you in that class also? Yeah. Oh. So, okay, sorry. Ask the question one more time. So when you talk about how conflict is second, it's a secondary issue, right? Right. What is the primary issue oftentimes? Well, I think pain and, and, okay. and um, sometimes an unmet need. Okay. Uh, you know, I think it's even at, the, at its core, I think it's a lot of pain, a lot of emotion, and an unmet need. Okay. So for individuals, how does that play out? Well, what do you think, Michelle? I'm going to get Michelle creative pieces <laughs> flowing here. What do I think about how it plays out? Yeah, how does that, well, how does that, how does that manifest itself, or how does that come into being, really, for individuals, you know, the pain and the, and the well, struggle? Well, sometimes they can put it, like, instead of being, you know, sad or hurt or something, they can be angry about it and kind of, I don't know, I think it also could be the lens of, like, thinking unjust or... Okay. Unfair? Yeah. Okay. What do you think, Cassie? Yeah, all those things. <laughs> <laughs> I talk too much. I love hearing about other people. I love that thought. Well, well, I think when Jamal was describing, like, they have pain or unmet needs, to me, that's like they're having these problems internally. And so the external is a conflict where maybe you're blaming it on someone because you don't know how to fix it internally. Okay. Can you think of an example? Okay, let's say someone was sexually abused as a child. Okay. And they get married and they have sexual relations and it doesn't work out as they plan. There's a lot of... There's or, a lot yeah, of, there's a lot of trauma there right. still or flashbacks. So then that pain from... The original trauma, maybe they'll blame it on their spouse or get upset with their spouse right. or whoever they're having the sexual relationship with because they still have that trauma that wasn't right. resolved. Very good example. So then, maybe I'm maybe I'm asking this question too, but 
So, how, but how do you think this plays out on a macro level in large conflicts, or do you think it's do you think it's similar dynamics, or do you think it's they are different dynamics? Probably similar. Well, I think, similar, I think but so much more complex. <laughs> similar, but much more complex. Well, I think you know, kind of going backwards a little bit when we talked about the power dynamic. I mm -hmm. mean, when that power dynamic is um, there's a wedge between you know one one group and between mm -hmm. another, it's mm -hmm. it still derives the same type of emotions within those individuals, even if you're looking at it from a macro perspective. Mm -hmm. And I would argue the same. I think that the dynamics, I, I agree with Cassie, I think the dynamics are very similar, but much more complex because you're dealing with large groups of people, you're dealing with often multiple issues. And a whole history. And, and history as well, yeah. absolutely. Um, we're going to talk about the Palestinian conflict a little bit and talk about history. I mean, there's so much history there, right? Um, it goes, part of it goes clear back to Abraham. Mm -hmm. It's a little while ago, right? Yeah. Depending on wow. the whole month, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Depending on you know which historical context you look at, roughly around four thousand years ago, right? Yeah. Because part of it, part of it boils, you know, is related to the fact that you know many Jewish people, Jewish Israelis, I should say, many Jewish Israeli people, believe that Israel is their homeland. Right? Mm -hmm. like, and it was, it was given to them by God. It's their promised land, right? Mm -hmm. from, from the Jordan River, and even beyond that, for some people, all the way to the ocean, right? It's kind of like the notion of manifest destiny for, that we had here in the United States 100 years ago, or 150 years ago, I should say. You know, that everything in between should belong to the United States. It's sort of the same type of thing. You know, everything from the Golan Heights, uh, which goes up into Syria, clear down to um, past Gaza into the to the Sinai Peninsula. Um, that's all supposed to be Israel, right? Well, then of course you have Palestinians who believe they came from, and most likely it's probably true, but they believe they came from Ishmael, who was Abraham's first son, firstborn son. Which, when you look at, you know, traditionally, of course, the birthright and all that went to first which son? The firstborn son, right? So, you know, but of course, the the Jewish people believe that the birthright went to or, 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 Isaac, or. correct, um, and not to Ishmael. The Arabic people believe that it went to Ishmael and not to Isaac, right? And that, and most of that is related to either to biblical texts, of course, or Quranic texts. Right, from the Quran. Well, and that's hard too because you can't be like, okay, well, <laughs> to help this conflict, let's just ask God and He'll tell us. Like, right. You can't just, I mean, <laughs> kind of it doesn't work. At least yeah, it doesn't, that's not it doesn't gonna, work very well, right? Yeah. So when you have two people that believe that they're both talking to God and they get two different answers. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so that's part of the conflict. I mean, so you can imagine how that complexity plays out, right? Like, well, no, this is our land. No, no, this is our land. And this but that's was, such you know, a small blah, 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 part of it. That's just the beginning. It's part of it, yeah. Because the culmination right. it's, of it's all only that part of it. There's politics just... that come into being. There's power that comes into being. Yeah. There's, there's victimization so that comes into being. All these different things, okay? Mm -hmm. Which we'll talk about more. Okay. <clears throat> all right, so where are we at? It is helpful. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm just going to go across. I'll get to you, I promise. Okay. It is helpful to distinguish three separate schools within this overall field. See contribution on framing in this volume. While at the same time recognizing the significant areas of overlap between them, all three not only articulate varying approaches to conflict intervention, but also reflect different conceptualizations of conflict. Okay, conflict management. That was conflict, a short paragraph. Conflict management theorists see violent conflicts as an in, ineradicable, ineradicable. Ir, ineradicable consequence of differences of values and interests within and between communities. The propensity to, viol, to violence arises from existing institutions and historical relationships. Very much what we were talking about. As well right? as from the established distribution of power. Resolving such conflicts is viewed as unrealistic. The best that we can be done is to manage and contain them 
and occasionally to reach a historic compromise in which violence may be laid aside and normal politics resumed. Conflict management is the art of appropriate intervention to achieve political settlements, particularly by those powerful actors having the power and resources to bring pressure on the opposing parties in order to induce them to settle. It is also the art of designing appropriate institutions to guide the inevitable conflicts into appropriate channels in the words of Bloomfield and Riley or Madam Secretary. This makes me think of it. <laughs> Conflict management is the positive and constructive handling of difference and divergence. Rather than advocating methods for removing conflict, it addresses the more realistic question of managing conflict, how to deal with it in a constructive way, how to bring opposing sides together in a cooperative process, how to design a practical, achievable, cooperative system for the constructive management of difference. Okay, so what do you guys think? Like Conflict management. What does that sound like? Treaties. Treaties. Peace agreements. Peace yeah. agreements. The, and I like how it says, you're not going to remove conflict. Right, and that's basically so, what we're talking about, right? Yeah. Because of all these other factors, right? Propensity of violence, historical relationships, distribution of power, right? This unequal power, things of that nature. These, these core issues that I do think tie back to what Jamal had said, you know, that it's it's about some pain, it's about some unmet need or injustice, like Marisa mentioned, right? Something along those lines, right? But it, but it plays out on a larger scale. It talks about the art, and it's so true. You have to get creative. I mean, absolutely. When you're coming up with these solutions and these, in if if you have power and you're able to come up with conflict, come up with deals and settle things and um, yeah, putting pressure on parties, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's just seriously, it's, you have to be creative in the ways that you do this. Yes. And it's the conflict management is the art of appropriate intervention. <coughs> appropriate intervention. Like that. That. And this is part of why I'm going to use Palestine because I'm most familiar with that conflict. Um, this is part of why there hasn't been a really successful conflict resolution. I think you could argue that on some level there's, you know, we, we go through spurts of conflict management where there's no fighting, at least no active fighting and stuff. It doesn't last for very long because they're, you know, they're not able to contain all these different things. But trying to get Israel to come to the table has been very difficult because Israel pretty much holds all the cards. They have, they have the power, they have the control, they have the means to maintain that control, and so there's not much of an incentive for them to give in to any pressure, to give in to pressure. Okay. So there's an imbalance of power in there. There's a significant imbalance of power, yeah. Hard to manage. Yeah. So, you know, it, anyway. Um, but again, the key there, of course, is managing. It's not resolving it not figuring it out, it is just managing it, right? Kind of like, you know, um, I think of domestic violence, right? It's, again, a scenario with which I have some familiarity. And, you know, if you have perpetrators who have the control, who have what they want, they're getting their, need, their needs met, why should they stop? Other than the fact, of course, it would be the humane thing to do, but since when was war conflict humane, right? So it's the same kind of concept. If you have, if you have a, somebody who is engaging in domestic violence and their partner is in control and their partner is getting their needs met, is in, you know, because violence within per, interpersonal relationships typically is a coping strategy it's a way for them to cope with their insecurities, with their fear, with their hurt, with their injustice, so to speak, by perpetrating on somebody else, right? It's not an effective means, it's not a healthy means, but for them it works, right? So they're still, you know, but, so it's like trying to say, okay, if you don't stop, then you will be arrested, you will be put in jail, whatever. And sometimes they will stop just because of that, but it doesn't resolve it. They're still, this is why if you don't get treatment for the perpetrators, it doesn't usually last very long. Okay, 
Anyway. Conflict resolution. Most back. Conflict resolution theorists, in contrast, reject this power political view of conflict, arguing instead that in communal and identity conflicts, people cannot compromise on their fundamental needs. However, they argue that it is possible to transcend conflicts if parties can be helped to explore, analyze, question, and reframe their positions and interests. Conflict resolution therefore emphasizes intervention by skilled but powerless third parties working unofficially with the parties to foster new thinking and new relationships. Now, I'm gonna pause you there. Why do you think that it's best, or that the approach has been, by powerless third parties? Why well, not a powerful third party, like the United States? Okay, possibly. I think the ulterior motives is part of that, for sure. I think of maybe some other reasons. If you have, the United States is a perfect example, right? Palestinian conflict. How many times has the United States tried to broker peace in the Middle East, in Palestine? Constantly since we were alive. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much since what, Truman. 1947? Right? Till 19, since 1947 <laughs> with Truman. And actually, 19, you know, 1946, 1947, as soon as Israel became a state, right? Um, how successful have we been? Obviously, not. Yeah, you know, we've had ups and downs. The it's most. The case with anything, it's the United States and the most, The most successful was probably the salt treaties between Egypt and Israel, where Anwar Sadat and Menachem Bacon. But that's a treaty again, so that's not conflict but resolution. But both of those, and it's, and it's sad and interesting at the same time, very sad, both of those leaders got killed because they were seen as too much of a pacifist or whatever, you know, right? So the United States has been involved in many, many ways, but why do you think the United States hasn't been able to resolve the conflict? Not just manage it, which we haven't done that either very well, but why do you think we haven't resolved it? Well, I mean, you, if you can come up with the answer, then, then I'll, send you, I'll send you over to the Middle East and you can negotiate because we haven't figured it out yet either. So I'm not expecting, I mean, like... I mean, I mean, purely kind of speculatively speaking, I think that, like, we... When, I think when another country interferes with another country's affairs, we kind of strip the individual's self-determination mm. to establish. Because if someone comes in and, like... Um, kind of rescues you, uh -huh. then it doesn't necessarily resolve the emotion and the history that's been established. It's just, you know, a referee coming in saying, this is what we're going to do, this is how we're going to do it, and this is the way it's going to be done. Somebody with more power than the, than the players themselves, right? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it doesn't really, yeah, I mean, it doesn't really move us any right. further ahead than where right. we've been. What were you going to say? I was just going to say the power balance. Is yeah. Been. Is, I mean, way Still out. in balance, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it'd be like another perpetrator coming into the domestic violence situation and saying, if you don't stop this, I'm going to beat you up. Right. It's really effective, right? I mean, it might stop it for a little while, but the person's needs are still unmet. The person's, you know, they still have that hurt. They still have the pain, you know, and it's just another dynamic of imposing, imposing your will. That was basically my thing about the whole power of dynamics. So, yeah. Sorry. It's all good. It's good. Well, also <laughs> how it says um, you can, uh, to transcend conflicts, you need to help people, like, reframe. Right. I feel like you can't like? do that on a big level, though. I mean, one-on-one -on -one maybe mm -hmm. with a lot of help, but on a le the level of an entire country, I don't know how realistic that is. It we'll takes time, generations that. of We'll educated. talk about that. Okay. We'll talk about that. Okay. But I want to say this. I do feel like sometimes there are situations where there does need to be a higher, a bigger power that comes in mm -hmm. to intervene. Mm -hmm. Our problem at the United States is that we typically enable instead of empower. Sure. Because if we were to go in and truly teach them and empower them and be that underground, like we're going to help you help yourself, but no, we totally enable and we destroy their integrity and, and right. their dignity, like you're saying. Well, and we don't help them at all, and then we pull out. And for the most part, we just and use the same. Conflict, right. the, and for the most part, we use the same tactics that the people in power are using themselves. Like, right. Okay, if you don't do this, then we're going to 
impose our will right. and, and hurt them. you in other ways, right? Yes, help them to... to um, well, which wouldn't work right. on an individual micro level. I mean, you know. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's kind of funny how this stuff played out, but, but I really, I'm glad that you guys are thinking because I want you to recognize, you know, by the end of today, I hope that I want you to recognize, you know, this, this connection between micro and mezzo. Um, one of the things you'll see in your macro practice class in spring semester is how you apply micro principles, of course, to macro level issues, right? You still have to engage. You still have to assess, right? You still have to develop a plan of intervention. Um, you're just doing it on a larger scale with more people. So it's more complex, but it's the same basic principle. You have to engage, you have to develop a rapport, relationship of trust with the powers that be, and then move forward. Um, I was just kind of gonna mention like ethnocentric views and like how, I mean, it is a power thing too, but then if you're coming in and saying like, hey, we're going to do this, and we're going to try it this way to help you, to help, you know, that type mm -hmm. of a thing. Like, how much of it is us imposing our will on them as opposed to, Precisely. like, helping them? Precisely. And this is why, for, you know, for conflict management, that's the approach, right? Somebody in power comes in and says, okay, quit fighting. You know, you guys get along. It's like two parents coming in, or your parent coming in to, with siblings and saying, okay, I'm going to separate you two, right? doesn't resolve the conflict right away, but it, it, it manages it, right? So they, is it more and parents oftentimes, of course, good parents will learn how to do conflict resolution with their children. Mediocre parents will just manage the conflict and just, okay, separate, you, guys, you go to your room, you go to your room, and come out when you can stop fighting or whatever, you know? It's not about resolution, but it's the same kind of thing. You know, like, okay, stop fighting, quit bugging each other, right? It doesn't resolve it, it manages it. Resolution required, this is why they, they emphasize a powerless third party, because if, a, if the third party is powerless, then who has to be the one to figure it out? The other two. The other two, exactly. The, they actually have to explore, analyze, reframe their positions and figure it out themselves. I think that's possible for you. <laughs> I mean, he's a little kid, and he's just acting right. like such a child. Right. Well, Sometimes you need adult intervention in that country, especially if you can sure. Sure. But if it could come from within, sure. But you know what? There's so much indoctrination there. It's ridiculous how they're so. Sure. They're sure. Just, it would be really hard. They'd it's, have to overcome him. There would have to be a military coup. I it's mean, hard to say. Um, well, at some point, there has to be a tipping point, right? Right. And thinking about Gladwell, there's got to be enough people in society that realize, yeah, this isn't really kosher, unintended. <laughs> um, this really isn't a healthy, healthy way of doing things. We need to change, and th there's been a lot. There's been a lot of debate amongst nonviolence activists about whether or not Hitler could have been overthrown through nonviolence because he was so ready to use violence himself, right? And what you know. So, but there's been a lot of debate among those those nonviolence theorists. Gosh, I like, would love to be in that debate, and seriously, to see the other side because right. how right. long would that have taken? How right. many more Jews would have right. been killed? How many more know. people would have been? Sure. But at some point, there has to be enough people that engage in nonviolent protest in order for things to happen. I mean, like India, right? But I think you could argue that Great Britain is probably a little bit more reasonable, a little bit. They're, they definitely had their moments in their, colon, their colonizing, right? But that they had at least some level of law and order, you know, within their regime. And so, Peaceful activism did work. Nonviolence um, and non cooperation. Right? It's hard to say. I mean, at this point, it's a moot. It's a moot argument to a large extent. But, um, but it still applies to North Korea because North Korea is still. You know, but North Koreans probably think similar things about the United States. Those U.S. people are mm, a little crazy. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But that's true. It's all about perspective. Anyway, sorry. Keep going. They seek to explore. They seek to explore what the roots of the oh, sorry, conflicts really are and how to identify creative solutions that the parties may have missed in their commitment to entrenched positions. 
Conflict resolution is about how parties can move from zero sum destructive patterns of conflict to positive sum constructive outcomes. The aim is to develop process of conflict resolution that appear to be acceptable to parties in dispute and effective in resolving conflict. That sounds like mediation, right? Yeah. You find ways, you find common ground, you find ways that you can both identify you know, as being beneficial, mutually beneficial, right? And, and also acknowledge self-determination, where both parties have a say and have input, right? Yeah, they come up with solutions. But that's what a, medi a good mediator, of course, utilizes these kinds of principles, right? They're creative, they identify other areas where they may have missed, where the two parties might have missed, and, and help support both parties to have a voice, to have input, and have a say without having real power. And even in most mediation, at least in our country, those mediators do have some power, some, but, it, but it's only in the sense that the court will agree with what they say. Yeah. But as far as imposing their will upon the, the mediators or the mediatees, I don't know, they have to be mediatees or something, but um, they can't really force them to do it, right? They can't say, if you have to do this or else, it's just, this is what we should do, this is what would be helpful, et cetera, et cetera, right? Any questions, comments? We might not get to you tomorrow, we'll see. Michelle, conflict transformation. Conflict transformation theorists argue that contemporary conflicts require more than the reframing of positions and the identification of win-win outcomes. The very structure of parties and relationships may be embedded in a pattern of conflictual relationships that extend beyond the particular site of conflict. Conflict transformation is therefore a process of engaging with and transforming relationships, interests, discourses, and if necessary, the very cons constitution of society that su supports the continuation of violent conflict. Constructive conflict is seen as a vital agent or catalyst for change. People with the conflict parties within a society of region affected and outsiders with relevant human and material resources all have complementary roles to play in the long-term process of peace building. This suggests a comprehensive and wide-ranging approach, emphasizing support for groups within a society in conflict rather than the mediation of outsiders. It also recognizes that conflicts are transformed gradually through a series of smaller or larger changes, as well as specific steps by means of which a variety of actors may play important roles in the words of Lederach. 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 He's one of the famous, he's, he's a well-known conflict transformation theorist. John keep going? Yes. Okay. Conflict transformation must actively envision, include, respect, and promote the human and cultural resources from within a given setting. This involves a new set of lenses through which we do not primarily see. The setting and the people in it as the problem, and the outsider as the answer. Rather, we understand the long-term goal of transformation, of validating and building on people and resources within the setting. Okay, so what is conflict transformation? According to this author, anyway. You don't have a third party. Okay. It includes constructive conflict. Okay. What does that mean, constructive conflict? I mean... Conflict that's good. Conflict that's good? Because like when you're trying to figure things out, it's not going to be like this easy, smooth sailing process. So right. kind of like constructive criticism where it's beneficial, and but it's under control. Okay. I think that's a good way of describing it. It's kind of like, um, like working with what they have, not bringing new things in. Is that kind of like what they're saying? Like well, I, with the resources and the people. With resources, yes. Have. With yeah. resources, Sorry, yes. Yeah, not necessarily ideas. Level. Yeah. Like, no, I'm talking on like resources. Right, like right, right, like right. The country, right. for example. It's, right. not like, it's not about bringing all these new things in, right. new resources. It's about using what you already right. have. Right, right. But if necessary, reconstituting society as a whole, like just reshaping it. So. If that's necessary. Which, in the Palestinian situation, I would say is probably necessary. So then this is just a random question. Is uh -huh. like Jeffrey Sachs like differential diagnosis, does that play into this at all? I would say so. 
So Jeff Jeffrey Sachs is an economist. Oh, God, how do I explain that in like two <laughs> seconds, right? It's a, he's an economist that basically applies this um, a very uh, ecological framework to economy. Sachs, Jeffrey Sachs, S A C H S. Yeah. End of poverty, I think it's called. Yeah, I made I made students read the end of poverty in international social work, and he utilizes a, a seven step process called that he refers to as differential diagnosis, basically taking a medical model and applying it to economics, saying, yeah. but you have to look at culture, you have to look at the the political issues, you have to look at geographical issues, you have to look at um, cultural issues in order to really effectively redevelop somebody's economy, or to develop, not necessarily redevelop, but to develop, to develop an economy. Yeah. You can't just say, okay, I'm gonna give you a bunch of money, and here you go, and your economy's fixed, right? You have to look at all these different parts of it. Very social work oriented, you know, because it's very ecological. You have to look at all the different systems, or at least, as, you know, multiple systems, in order to effectively address poverty, right? Yeah. I just didn't know if that like I, no, I think I think that's a lot of the same type yeah. same approach, right? Yeah. Um, being able to identify at least as far as identifying complexity, right? Identifying issues that need to be addressed, right? That's the most the, main, the major one. Sure, 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 sure. So how would you apply this to oh go ahead. I'm just gonna guess it reminds me of the Revolutionary War mm -hmm. with England. Right. And it's a it's a PTG model in the fact that we're allies with them now, and right. you know we did have a completely new constitution, right. and we were able to break away and build our own country. And and there's not conflict still. Like we're right. still, they're not all right. You're jumping ahead. You're jumping ahead, but that's okay. <laughs> that's a that's a perfect example of conflict transformation. Okay. Right? Are we in conflict management with with Britain still? No. Are we just managing the conflict. No. Are we even just resolving the conflict? No. We're allies. Right? And really, that's what conflict transformation seeks to accomplish, is to not just you know, keep people from fighting with each other, but actually working together in order to accomplish a common goal or to, to overcome whatever. Right? So it's really kind of fascinating. And this is why, so in what way does this maybe apply, maybe it doesn't at all, to PTG? Right. Surviving and thriving. It's like it's like victimization, conflict management. Surviving, conflict resolution. Thriving, conflict transformation. Right. And when you think about the dynamics of each of those, it fits, at least in my mind, it fits really well with this kind of a model. Right. You got to rethink things. You've got to right, have new possibilities. You've got to have personal strength. Have to have all these different components that are part of PT, the part of the PTG process, and apply that to the conflict situation. Now, is that easy? No, <laughs> it is not. But it has been applied, and it has been successful in some instances. Well, and I think that, like, you know, unfortunately, war is kind of one of those. Those. I guess what I was going to say is that, like, think about like the Revolutionary War, uh -huh. and then you think about the Civil War. Each one of those kind of propelled us further than where we were before. Yeah, there's, I mean, obviously war is kind of a last resort and what we want to happen, but sure. the, the, the result of it in a lot of cases, some cases, is it moves humanity a little further than they were before. Sure. Um, and then like when you talk about con kind of the, like constructivism or, con uh, yeah, I guess constructivism, like, when two parties are trying to work something out, there's both something that you have to give. And mm -hmm. so it does take a long time because, you know, there's a process of where you have to kind of deliberate with what you're willing to give up. Um, and that's a process that's really ugly, is, right. is you know, sure. what am I willing to give sure. up in sure. order to meet the person sure. halfway? Sure, sure, I like it. True. All right, Jamal, that's exactly right. What's the biggest problem? <laughs> Right now. They have a really difficult so time amazing. letting go. I would say, you know, if I could, if I could point to one specific characteristic that 
impedes the peace process, I would say they have a very good memory that's applied in very bad and inappropriate ways, right? They, they remember everything that's happened. Um, the Israelis, they remember, of course, Jerusalem being sacked. They remember the Holocaust, and they cite this time and time again. Like, we have the right to defend ourselves because we almost became annihilated, and we will use whatever means we need to, u to utilize in order to protect ourselves. The irony behind that, of course, is they're doing some of the same things to protect themselves that, that were used against them. them by the Nazi regime. Yep. It's just crazy. Well, I think the thing But is they, and they don't forget, you know, and the Palestinians are the same way. They go back centuries and say, you know, well, this and this and this and this and this and this. So they've got to, at some point, move past that. And I don't know what that's going to take, you know. And there are some, but there are some, there are factions I don't know if factions is the right word. There are there are groups within both sides that are recognizing this and that are wanting to put the past behind them, so to speak, right? Really? There are there are. It's they're small, <laughs> they're relatively wow. small, but there are there they are there. Sorry. I know I just I was gonna add to what you were saying and just that um, the thing that makes um, kind of macro issues so ugly is that there is one a long line of history behind it. And number two, there is a, I mean, every individual kind of almost perpetuates the problem mm -hmm. in kind of a communal setting, right? I mean, if right. it's like, if there's an issue and you have everybody in your community that believes the same thing, I mean, you've got this huge amount of support. And that's why it's so hard to change history is because you have that, right. that community of that ideal or whatever it is that people are so right up on. Absolutely. All right, take a look at this. See what you think. Be thinking about PTG, be thinking about conflict transformation as well. Twelve years ago, I picked up a camera for the first time uh, to film the olive long, harvest it? in a Palestinian village in the West Bank. I thought I was there to make a single documentary and would then move on to some other part of the world. But something kept bringing me back. Now, usually when international audiences hear about that part of the world, they often just want that conflict to go away. The Israeli-Palestinian conflict is bad, and we wish it could just disappear. We feel much the same way about other conflicts around the world. But every time we turn our attention to the news, it seems like one more country has gone up in flames. So I've been wondering whether we should not start looking at conflict in a different way. Whether instead of simply wishing to end conflict, we focus instead on how to wage conflict. This has been a big question for me, one I've pursued together with my team at the nonprofit Just Vision. After witnessing several different kinds of struggles in the Middle East, I started noticing some patterns on the more successful ones. I wondered where these variables held across cases, and if they did, what lessons we could glean for waging constructive conflict in Palestine, Israel, and elsewhere. There is some science about this. In a study of 323 major political conflicts from 1900 to 2006, Maria Stephan and Erica Chenoweth found that nonviolent campaigns were almost 100% more likely to lead to success than violent campaigns. Nonviolent campaigns are also less likely to cause physical harm to those waging the campaign as well as their opponents and critically, they typically lead to more peaceful and democratic societies. In other words, nonviolent resistance is a more effective and constructive way of waging conflict. But if that's such an easy choice, why don't more groups use it? Political scientists Victor Assal and colleagues have looked at several factors that shape a political group's choice of tactics. And it turns out that the greatest predictor of a movement's decision to adopt nonviolence or violence is not whether that group is more left-wing or right-wing, not whether the group is more or less influenced by religious beliefs, not whether it's up against a democracy or a dictatorship, and not even the levels of repression that that group is facing. The greatest predictor 
of a movement's decision to adopt nonviolence is its ideology regarding the role of women in public life. When a movement includes in its discourse language around gender equality, it increases dramatically the chances it will adopt nonviolence and thus the likelihood it will succeed. The research squared up with my own documentation of political organizing in Israel and Palestine. I've noticed that movements which welcome women into leadership positions, such as the one I documented in a village called Budrus, were much more likely to achieve their goals. This village was under a real threat of being wiped off the map when Israel started building the separation barrier. The proposed route would require the destruction of this community's olive groves, their cemeteries, and would ultimately close the village from all sides. Through inspired local leadership, they launched a nonviolent resistance campaign to stop that from happening. The odds were massively stacked against them. But they had a secret weapon. A 15-year-old girl who courageously jumped in front of a bulldozer which was about to uproot an olive tree, stopping it. In that moment, the community of Budrus realized what was possible if they welcomed and encouraged women to participate in public life. And so it was that the women of Budrus went to the front lines day after day using their creativity and acumen to overcome multiple obstacles they faced in a 10-month unarmed struggle. And as you can probably tell at this point, they win at the end. The separation barrier was changed completely to the internationally recognized Green Line, and the women of Budrus came to be known across the West Bank for their indomitable energy. Thank you. I want to pause for a second, which you helped me do, because I do want to tackle two very serious misunderstandings that could happen at this point. The first one is that I don't believe women are inherently or essentially more peaceful than men. But I do believe that in today's world, women experience power differently. Having had to navigate being in the less powerful position in multiple aspects of their life, women are often more adept at how to surreptitiously pressure for change against large, powerful actors. The term manipulative, often charged against women in a derogatory way, reflects a reality in which women have often had to find ways other than direct confrontation to achieve their goals. And finding alternatives to direct confrontation is at the core of nonviolent resistance. Now the second potential misunderstanding. I've been talking a lot about my experiences in the Middle East. I'm going to pause that for just a second because I, I just want to make it, you'll see this, for those of you who are taking my class next semester, you'll see this, but um, the sad thing is that, you know, like she said, women are not necessarily less inclined to violence per se, but it's, it's a way, you know, but oftentimes they have to find creative strategies to equalize the power, right? The sad thing is, is that oftentimes in our, in our country what has been happening over the last few decades is that women are just using weapons more. So women are actually more likely to use weapons in domestic violence situations than men are, in order to equalize the power. Not necessarily the best way to get to the point of conflict transformation, but it is one of the ways that has been emerging. But guess who's telling them to do this? Society. Police officers. Right. That are men. Right. Absolutely. Equalize the power and you'll be all right, right? Yeah, exactly. They're the ones that are And some of the gun. Right. You might be thinking now that the solution then is for us to educate Muslim and Arab societies to be more inclusive of their women. If we were to do that, they would be more successful. They do not need this kind of help. Women have been part of the most influential movements coming out of the Middle East. But they tend to be invisible to the international community. Our cameras are largely focused on the men who often end up involved in the more confrontational scenes that we find so irresistible in our news cycle. And we end up with a narrative that not only erases women, 
from the struggles in the region, but often misrepresents the struggles themselves. In the late 1980s, an uprising started in Gaza and quickly spread to the West Bank and East Jerusalem. It came to be known as the First Intifada, and people who have any visual memory of it generally conjure up something like this. Palestinian men throwing rocks at Israeli tanks. The news coverage at the time made it seem like stones, Molotov cocktails, and burning tires were the only activities taking place in the Intifada. This period, though, was also marked by widespread nonviolent organizing in the forms of strikes, sit-ins, and the creation of parallel institutions. During the First Intifada, whole sectors of the Palestinian civilian population mobilized, cutting across generations, factions, and class lines. They did this through networks of popular committees and their use of direct action and communal self-help projects challenged Israel's very ability to continue ruling the West Bank and Gaza. According to the Israeli army itself, 97% of activities during the First Intifada were unarmed. And here's another thing that is not part of our narrative about that time. For 18 months in the Intifada, women were the ones calling the shots behind the scenes. Palestinian women from all walks of life in charge of mobilizing hundreds of thousands of people in a concerted effort to withdraw consent from the occupation. Naila Yash, who strived to build a self-sufficient Palestinian economy by encouraging women in Gaza to grow vegetables in their backyard, an activity deemed illegal by the Israeli authorities at the time. <laughs> Rabbi Hadiyah, who took over the decision-making authority for the entire uprising when the men who had been running it were deported. <laughs> Fatima al Jafari, who swallowed leaflets containing the uprising's directives in order to spread them across the territories without getting caught. And Zahira Kamal, who ensured the longevity of the uprising by leading an organization that went from 25 women to 3,000 in a single year. Despite their extraordinary achievements, none of these women have made it into our narrative of the first intifada. We do this in other parts of the globe, too. In our history books, for instance, and in our collective consciousness, men are the public faces and spokespersons for the 1960s struggle for racial justice in the United States. But women were also a critical driving force, mobilizing, organizing, taking to the streets. How many of us think of Septima Clark when we think of the United States civil rights era? Remarkably few, but she played a crucial role in every phase of the struggle, particularly by emphasizing literacy and education. She's been omitted, ignored, like so many other women who played critical roles in the United States civil rights movement. This is not about getting credit. It's more profound than that. The stories we tell matter deeply to how we see ourselves and to how we believe movements are run and how movements are won. The stories we tell about a movement like the First Intifada or the United States Civil Rights Era matter deeply and have a critical influence in the choices Palestinians, Americans, and people around the world will make next time they encounter an injustice and develop the courage to confront it. If we do not lift up the women who played critical roles in these struggles, we fail to offer up role models to future generations. Without role models, it becomes harder for women to take up their rightful space in public life. And as we saw earlier, one of the most critical variables in determining whether a movement will be successful or not is a movement's ideology regarding the role of women in public life. This is a question of whether we're moving towards more democratic and peaceful societies. 
in a world where so much change is happening and where change is bound to continue at an increasingly faster pace. It is not a question of whether we will face conflict, but rather a question of which stories will shape how we choose to wage conflict. Thank you. And I want to stand up and clap too. What did you guys think? That was really eye opening. Yeah. Where's Jack? He's on holiday. What do you need? Oh, I need the temperature on. for pod five. I need the temperature for pod five. Thoughts? I thought it was very good and very powerful, and um, I don't know, I like how she said that it's not about taking credit, it's not about giving credit, but that it's, you know, it's deeper rooted than that. Right. And it is true, and I definitely agree with her that, I mean, history is definitely written by the people who were in power, and at that point, the men had a voice, women didn't necessarily, and so, sure. I don't know, yeah. And just that there's other ways to resolve conflict it doesn't have to be violence right and Education in fact or the more successful types of conflict are not are nonviolent right or conflict resolution I should say of, of dealing with conflict and I think that where I mean I need to go through and look at their at their study because it, it seems like we talked about this at the symposium though and that is you know that when you have violence that resolves conflicts Rarely, if ever, does it result in conflict transformation, right? It can help push it to that, towards that, perhaps, you know, like, I mean. But they might have more hard feelings, so it'd be right, harder to right. transform. Take longer. Right, it's gonna yeah. take longer. And it took a long time. It actually did take quite a while for us to become friends with England. You know, we had the War of 1812 that really sort of helped put things kind of to, you know, the conflict was managed pretty well. And then it was, I think it was really um, other wars against other powers that helped really solidify that, right? Mm -hmm. Certainly the, the, um, the Napoleonic Wars, that played into it. The, the, and the other um, European wars, that played into it. But I think what really solidified it, of course, was World War I, where we pretty much had to be allies. Yeah. Right. They needed they needed us to help them. But anyway, um, and it does you know when she was talking about how this is perhaps a negative you know one of the negative aspects. But um, when she was talking about how you know when the, the 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 successful conflicts are when women are included as part of that dialogue, right? And given given that voice, so to speak. And it just reminded me, you know, and she talked. She mentioned the civil rights movement. And it just reminded me when when uh, the slaves were first emancipated and African Americans were first given rights, right? Did everybody receive rights? Mm -hmm. No, it was the men. men. And it was sad because for a long time, of course, some of the strongest abolitionist movements were by women. Mm -hmm. And also women that were seeking suffrage, women that were seeking the vote. And yet, and when, but when the two factions came together, the two groups, um, factions suggest conflict in and of itself, but when the two groups came together to talk about, okay, where do we go from here, they decided, you know, the, well, the majority decided, no, we're not gonna try and get suffrage for all women, we're, you know, because then, you know, we're gonna separate that out and only get voting rights for men, for, for, um, for African-American males. I think that really damaged it. You know, it took a long time for that to come around again, and then it took even longer for the civil rights movement to really become more solidified. But that's just one thing that came to mind. Um, so how does this play into conflict transformation and, and or PTG? Fighting might not be the best route that you have to, like, Cassie said, get creative, think of other things that you can do. Right. New possibilities, right? Personal strength rather than, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, of course I'm not talking about force, but personal strength in other areas. Being able to identify your own um, 
needs as well as acknowledging the needs for others and that, that connectedness to others, right? Mm -hmm. Connecting to others. That is an essential part of this. So how do we get people in conflict to connect to each other? They have to reframe. <laughs> they have to reframe, for sure. Identify their own commonalities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we don't have time to watch all of this and have the discussion I would like, so I'm going to skip ahead. I think the last, about the last half of it, is still going to be sufficient um, to make the point. As long as our body is heavy with the fatigue of travel. Then I gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the city. Sounds really bad. Didn't hear it. We cannot be satisfied as long as the Negro's basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs saying for whites only. So what's he describing? Oppression? Yeah. Oppression, inequality, right? He's, he's identifying the differences between the two groups. Right? Yeah. And as long as we have these differences, there's going to be a problem. We cannot be satisfied as long as a Negro in Mississippi cannot vote. And a Negro in New York believes he has nothing for which to vote. No, no, we are not satisfied, and we will not be satisfied until justice rolls down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Some of you have come here out of great trials and tribulations. Some of you have come fresh from narrow jail cells. Some of you have come from areas where your fresh quest for freedom left you battered by the storms of persecution and staggered by the winds of police brutality. You have been the veterans of creative suffering, continue to work with the pain. That unearned suffering is redemptive. Go back to Mississippi. Go back to Alabama. Go back to South Carolina. Go back to Georgia. Go back to Louisiana. Go back to the slums and get old to our northern cities. Knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. Let us not wallow in the valley of despair. I say to you today, my friends, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created in I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will they be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream. 
my poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. He didn't talk about violence at all. He, um, it made me think of Frankel, the hope that he had. Yeah, he had this hope and he says, I I'm not giving up this hope until it happens. But he didn't ever talk about violence or mm -hmm. hurting anyone. Okay. He didn't even talk about like necessarily, I don't want to say shifting the power because it had to be a shifting power, but he didn't talk about like, let's put ourselves above you. It wasn't degrading the other group. It was saying, let's be equal. Yeah, yeah hold hands together. Right. Mm -hmm. Sit down at a table together. What do you think, Jamal? Um, I, yeah, I think there, there was a lot of, well, I have kind of two conflicting thoughts. One, I kind of think of Nelson Mandela because he was an advocate for nonviolent protesting, you know, and he spent a, a long, long time in jail or prison, right. um, and so he, he had kind of that trial, but I think that 
Um, so there's kind of a parallel in that kind of nonviolence component that right. you know, we use our voices and we continue to kind of um, raise our voices to the injustice and you know, uh, mm-hmm. and and I like the hope aspect that Dr. King, you know, kind of the message that he, you know, gives mm-hmm. in that go to back to your places, and you know, kind of let your voices be heard there, so we can spread, you know. So I think right. there's a lot of really powerful things about his speech. Right. So from a conflict transformation, what was it that you that you think helped transform the conflict? here in the United States. Well, his attitude of connectedness, like you're talking about in the community, like seeking to connect to others and relating to others. He's wanting to connect to them. Right. There was a spiritual aspect. Right. There was also a right. um, new possibility. I right. mean, he, was, he just basically talks about PTP in every form as a society, that that's what was gonna happen. I really think that that is the key. You have to help the people that are part of the conflict, the people that are involved in the conflict, you have to help them see their common humanity. His dream, right? I have a dream. Black men, white men, Jews and Gentiles, Catholics and Protestants, that they will see each other for who they are beyond those labels, right? They'll see their common humanity. And I've seen, you know, as I've had the opportunity to work in the Middle East and and interact with Palestinians, their desires are basically the same as the desires of the Jewish people. They just want to be able to live in peace, to provide for their family, work hard, and spend time with those with their loved ones. That's that's pretty much it. Pretty crazy, right? <laughs> I mean, that's the sad thing is that they, but then they focus on these other aspects that don't even form the majority of their humanity. It's just a small part. Well, if you think of the opposite end, Hitler, what did he focus on? He focused on everything that was different. Exactly. Instead of saying, they're human too, like, they have families. Exactly. So. And that's what, you know, I mean, it's a simple concept perhaps, you know, I have a dream that everybody will be able to see each other for who they are and judge each other for who they are, not by these other labels that often get imposed upon them, right? Um, So it's not necessarily, it's not an easy thing to accomplish, and and I would argue that we're still working through conflict transformation with regard to blacks and whites here in the United States. We're still working towards that. I mean, we've come, we've come quite a ways, but I would say that we still haven't fully accomplished his dream, (laughs) right? But we're making progress, we're making progress, it just, you know, but the, and the things that I think that continue to detract from that dream are, foc- are when we focus on those differences. And the right. media too, right? I mean, there are more, more people than not sure. that are actually pushing this and, and are, are promoting equality. But in the media, all we see is just well, the people course, that are, you know, those, those are the few outliers. Of course, outliers. our current administration is, is really helping with that. So, no. the current administration is not respected, so... Um, I'm one of the VPs for the Black Student Union this year, Uh and we already had a um, meeting with like people in, they have like a presidential suite, it's pretty cool, right? (laughs) So we went over there, and we had a meeting with like Kyle Reyes and this committee Uh of people, and we were trying to decide like what we wanted our theme to be for um, the MLK commemoration this year, Uh and um, you know, some of us kind of said that same thought about like not having achieved the dream. And like realizing, yes, we've come a long way, but like, has it really been achieved type of a thing? And then somebody else brought up the idea of like, maybe it's just, like some people think it's expanded, like that it's now not just this one group of people. And not that MLK was even about one group of people. He was like poverty, religion, all that stuff, right? Right, right, mm-hmm. right. And so we have right. um, expanded on that, but then we also talked about um, what does the dream look like now, I guess, as opposed mm-hmm. to what it looked like mm-hmm. 50 years ago. Um, so I think that too, like, I don't know, like all these people, we now have the same, like we have the same goals, and I don't know if it was, it probably came from your mouth, how you said, <laughs> and how you said um, these people all have, the, or what was it, that when you get, or no, it was my friend the other day, he was reading something, 
and there was like this side of things and this side of things. And when they all sat down and they like hashed it out, um, the majority of people had um, wanted the same things, I guess. I don't know if it was in, in regards to like the government or politics or whatever, but the majority of people wanted the same thing once you like sat and hashed it all out. There was only like maybe 17% difference on their list of right. what they were right. Right. seeing. But that was all that anybody was focusing on was the right. small percentage. Right. And I would, I would argue, and and there most a, a lot of research plays this out. Um, is that most people in the United States are the same way. You know, whether you voted for Trump or whether you voted for Hillary Clinton or whether you voted for Bernie Sanders or whoever, they have much more in common than they do have difference. Yeah. Um, even the most, you know, conservative right wing politician or or advocate. I probably still have more in common with them, more in common with them than not. I don't consider myself a right wing politician, but just just in case you were curious. <laughs> but so, and that's the sad thing, right? Is that, and I think the media, of course, is a big part of that because media, the conflict, for whatever reason, the conflict sells. You know, there are times where we rally around, you know, some common purpose, but it seems to be too short lived, right? Unfortunately. This is a little bit off topic, but just something that's going through my mind is um, feminism and women's rights. Mm -hmm. And not saying that we're fully to the point that we should be with feminism, but the thing that concerns me now is feminists are going overboard, saying mm -hmm. that we're better, women are better than men. Sure, and sure, so I think sure, that's sure. something that you also have to be careful of with conflict mm -hmm. transformation, mm -hmm. is bringing it to equality mm -hmm. and then not being like, well, we got this far, let's keep going. Right, Absolutely. right. So that's just... And I really think that, to a large extent, that's why, you know, um, the Black Panther movement and other black power movements weren't as successful because... They were trying to go above. Because they, they were still, they, they started using the same tactics that, that others have used to oppress, right? Mm -hmm. Not identical. I mean, they were helpful in the sense, of course, to say, Hey, we do have power, and we can, we can take the power that we want, yeah. um, or that we we deserve power. That that part of it, I think, of course, was was perfectly fine. You know, that's normal. But then they started to become more militant and saying we should take the power, right? Which that's that's the same tactic that others have used. It doesn't work in the long term. Short term, it can work, but in the long term, it doesn't work out because it just adds more to the conflict. It just adds different nuances, adds different complexity, and adds more violence. So we talk about like racial conflict and then we talk about gender conflict or feminism. Mm -hmm. um, and then, because I've heard before, and I guess I believe it, but I'm <laughs> I guess I believe that, it. <laughs> Um, and I know it's true, right? But that, um, like for me, as a black woman, I'm in a whole different category than like a white woman in a whole uh -huh. different category sure. than a black man type of a thing. Sure. And that I have kind of like, I guess that black women have their own like thing to fight for type of whatever. Mm -hmm. What have you, I guess, like heard about that, seen about that? Like or like double indemnity. In like conflict resolution or transformation or whatever. Um. I think it, it just adds, it adds to the complexity for sure um, because we still don't have equality for women in our society. We still definitely don't have equality for people of color in our society. So you're, you're dealing with both of those complexities. You know? and, but I still think that the solution is the same and that is to be able to recognize the same humanity, the same uh, rights, the same level of equality that everybody deserves. Accomplishing that, of course, that's the complexity. That's what that's what we have to figure out, and we haven't figured out. And if I, you know, again, I've said this many times. If I had all those answers, I probably would not be teaching here at UVU. I'd be somewhere else, right? Um, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Still making an impact here, I suppose. <laughs> but, I'm but I think, you know, I do think that there's, you know, as I go through different things, different ideas. Hopefully, you know, I, I should write more of this stuff down because I don't read it elsewhere as that often, anyway. And so we need to get these ideas. Education is still an important part of that, you know. And, and as she mentioned, the thing that really stood out for the Palestinians 
in the successful aspects of their conflict was education, right? Educating people about what needed to happen, about who they are, who they deserve to be, you know, and just having those basic rights. And, and it's sad because, you know, as I've been over there, the nonviolence movement is not gaining ground. At least it's not gaining ground very quickly. It's still, it's still more on the fringe than it is in the mainstream, and the people that want to use violence to solve the conflict are still the loudest voices, and are still the ones that are being seen and, and everything else. The problem, of course, with violence too, and we saw this here in the United States, we see this almost everywhere, um, is that when, when the oppressed population fights back, Typically, all it does is just justify, you know, in the minds of the oppressors, it just justifies the means, right? Like, see, they're fighting us, so we have to fight them and in order to protect ourselves, right? And all that does, you know, I like Gandhi's quote, of course, you know, an eye for an eye just makes the entire world blind. Eventually, that's what it will do. And I was hoping to bring in some, some of Gandhi's teachings as well, but, you know, not enough time. <laughs> but anyway, um, I hope it gives, you know, obviously we just barely delved into conflict transformation, but I hope you can see the connection with, between conflict transformation and PTG. I think that the core principles are the same. Yeah. Uh, I think that the application is very similar. It just, it's more complex, of course, because you're looking at the macro level, but it's still possible. You know, we can still facilitate, just like when we can facilitate post-traumatic growth on an individual level, we have the potential to facilitate conflict transformation on the macro level, PTG on the macro level, right? And I was talking to Cassie about this, I know we're out of time, but one last little story. I was talking to Cassie about this when I had the opportunity to go to Cambodia, God, it's been about 10 years now. Um, they felt, you know, they were still very much in this victimization mode, you know. I mean, they felt like when I would talk to victims of violence, you know, the whole country was like that. Because they hadn't been able to move forward. They hadn't been able to address it. They had not been able to acknowledge the trauma. They hadn't been able to deal with the trauma that they'd experienced from a five-year civil war that killed a third of their people and a ten-year occupation by Vietnam. They had not been able to deal with it. As they started to, you could start to feel a sense of, of growth, a sense of new beginnings. I mean, just barely, I mean, like, like a little seedling, you know, that just barely poking up. <laughs> because they were starting to finally address it from, you know, by prosecuting some of the Pol Pot regime, right, in the international tribunals. Um, but it was still so new, right? And so I've only, and, I've, and in Palestine, I've only witnessed the, the problems, the, the ongoing conflict and the result of that conflict. Um, you could argue, perhaps, I mean, certainly with the United States and Britain, to some degree, the IRA and the Republican and the, the um, um, Northern Ireland, right, uh, being able to come together, they're starting to get to that point. Um, right now, I'd say they're still in the conflict management slash resolution aspect. But we have examples of conflict transformation and, and post-traumatic growth, and I think the more we can identify those and push for those different things. If anybody's interested in macro practice at all, these are ideas I want you to, to like expand and, and grow. Because uh, I do think that we can facilitate that as long as, you know, as long as we put forth that effort. Any other thoughts, comments, questions, queries, denials? When are we doing our presentations? Oh. <laughs> oh. Fourth oh, year. All right, it's all right. Um, you guys want to do it Tuesday or Wednesday? Mine's I was done. planning tomorrow. Okay. But we can we can push it to Wednesday if you want. Let's do it tomorrow so we don't have to come to class on Wednesday. Or will we still have class on Wednesday? <laughs> this is a real question. Um, no, if we do it tomorrow, we probably could <laughs> do other things on Wednesday. Is it time tomorrow to do everyone? I think so. If, every, if everybody takes 15 minutes, I will take then that's an hour and a half. Minutes. You'll you said between 10 and 15. Right? I said between 10 and 15 minutes, yes. I got it. Done. So I'm just saying, if everybody actually took 15 minutes, that's still an hour and a half. So there's time. Just be Is here Is everybody time. okay with tomorrow? Or 
I'm redo okay. it. Yeah. Time. Well, that was the original plan was to do it tomorrow, but then we were thinking of doing like a 